We're taking the month of August to consider the best part that is yet to come. That's the reality of, of our glorified and eternal lives and the immediate presence of God, uh, the joy and the excitement that is heaven. And with scripture open, let's pray together. From the north to the south and the east and the west, God, it's a tremendous opportunity to be called and invited by the power of your Holy Spirit on this day, your day, set aside to recall and to remember whose and what we are. Sons and daughters of Almighty God, co-heirs of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, enlivened and empowered by the strength of your Holy Spirit to live and rejoice today and to live and rejoice forever with you. So remind us again, show us once more. Help us to capture a picture of all that awaits those who believe. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I suppose it starts with a, a confession of sorts. Worship services were excruciatingly long and boring as a child. Now, I'm going to say that's my opinion. I'm going to say that's my experience, and that's my remark. As a child, they all seemed to be long. It seemed to be an exercise or a practice in endurance, sometimes forced concentration. And no matter how hard I tried in that fight every single week, I seemed to lose. It was almost the longest hour of the week. Sitting in a, a wooden pew, there was no cushion beneath me. There was no cushion behind me. I would try to busy my mind by staring at, at the windows of stained glass, trying to count how many pieces in, in that window. When I would lose count, I would, I would stare up at the, at the chandeliers and I would try to figure out how many light bulbs are in this sanctuary. When that didn't work, I would look at the paneled ceiling, squares that were filled with squares, and I would try to count and do the math and do the multiplication, but I would get lost in it all. I longed for the moment when, when my dad would pass the roll of lifesavers down the aisle. We were always told to wait for the long prayer. And the lifesavers would make their way down. And, and I was always hoping for an orange one. And those candies truly lived up to their name. A lifesaver helping me to bear up through the worship service. You know, my mind would wander in so many different directions. And I suppose it was obvious enough to the rest of my family, especially my mother, when she would reach over with her right hand so unknowingly to others and yet very much aware by me as her nails would dig in just above the knee of my left leg. The scars are still there. I don't feel good about this opinion, but as an elementary-aged child, worship was a test of endurance. Wrongly, I know, it was an experience to bear. For me, it happened once a week. And then, free, six days to follow. Here's why this is an unfortunate childhood opinion. Because for some people, for some folks, even adults, they view heaven through those very same lenses. 
Some folks view heaven as, as an unending worship service and, and the thought of having to experience worship that will never end. The thought of it being worship that goes on and on and on. It leaves some people asking the question. In fact, I've had people ask the question, is that all we're going to do? I've had people tell me, it sounds boring. Our eternal glorified lives will be more than worship. I want you to know over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the fact that heaven and, and our glorified everlasting lives, it's going to involve tremendous relationships. We are going to be given responsibilities and, and things to do. More on that next week and the week following. But indeed, heaven is going to be all about worship. Say that with me, all about worship. Heaven will be encompassed with worship unlike anything we've ever experienced before. No matter how many worship services you've attended. John gives us a picture of this in Revelation 21, beginning at, at verse 15. Listen to what he saw. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Worship. In our glorified state, our bodies made like unto his glorious resurrected body. One of the realities of heaven and our lives eternal will be worship. But what is that worship going to be like? What is that worship going to encompass? First of all, that worship is going to be about relationship. Worship in heaven is going to be all about relationship and a very intimate relationship. Now, I wonder if there's anybody you've ever wanted to get to know. Maybe you've had a desire to, to meet somebody up close and personal. You've been following this person. You've been reading about this person. You've been watching this person. You've been listening to this person if they're a singer. And yet you've always had some distance between you. Maybe the closest you'd ever been able to get to that person was from your seat in the arena as they were far, far away. You're just staring at their face on a jumbotron. 
Maybe the closest you could get to that person was sitting at home staring at your television. Maybe the closest you could get to that person was reading what they're posting on on social media. But no matter what you do, no matter what you try, you just can't get close. There's always this distance between you. And maybe it feels that way this morning. Even when we're joined here intentionally in worship. No matter how many worship services you've been to. No matter how many sermons you've listened to, how many songs you've sung, how many prayers you've, you've been a part of, there, there still feels to be this distance. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter where you attend, you never feel close to God. It seems like there's something in the way. Say that with me. It seems like there's something in the way. And there is. Exactly. There is something in the way, and it's just that that simple, single little word, sin. Say it with me. Sin. You say, yes, but we're forgiven of our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. And yet still in this world, we continue to face temptation. We continue to endure these trials and we continue to pursue the things of this world and the wants that well up within us. And this struggle with sin interrupts our intimacy with God. It is this sin that that creates yet this distance between us and God even and sometimes especially when we're trying to worship him. You remember the Ten Commandments. How many were there? Ten. Two tablets. The first tablet, Commandments 1, 2, 3, and 4, they deal specifically with with our, our vertical relationship with God. Because God desires to have this relationship with us. He says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. We're going to be close with one another. You're going to worship me and me alone. God gave us those instructions to keep that distance small. God did not desire this brokenness or or this separation. God said, I I want you to, to remember that's me and only me. There's one God. He said, I don't want you giving in to these idols, to these other pursuits, to these other whims and and wants. Don't let anything else get, get your best time, talent, and treasure. God says, all of that belongs to me. God says, revere me. Recognize that my name is holy. Don't just be throwing my name out as an exclamation point when you stub your toe. And God says, remember my day. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. And especially spend time with me. And yet even those four, designed to keep our relationship with God close, we've broken all four. A reminder of our sin And the fact that no matter what we do on a Sunday, we are still approaching God from a distance. There is still this separation here and now. Now, I want you to travel back to the temple. We did a series a while back on the construction of of the temple, on the construction of of the tabernacle. And as as you remember, surrounding the temple is is the courtyard. And, And yet these these large doors that would allow you to enter into the temple itself. You're, you're smelling the wafting incense and you see the, the, the illumination of, of the lights that are burning and, uh, and bringing certain brightness to that space. And yet in front of you is this great and tremendous curtain from, from ceiling to floor. And that curtain is separating the Holy of Holies, from the rest of of the temple. And it's in that Holy of Holies where God's presence would be brought to bear. 
where the presence of God would, would hover over the, the mercy seat, where the presence of God would hover over the, the Ark of the Covenant. All of this took place in the Holy of Holies, and yet the Holy of Holies kept the outside outside, kept the people of God distanced and away from a holy God. Only once a year. How often? Once a year the high priest could make his way into that space. You know, it was an interesting room. God commanded that the holy of holies should be built with equal width and depth and height. The holy of holies in its construction was a, was a perfect cube. Concerning our worship in heaven. Concerning our worship one day in heaven. John gives us this picture of the new Jerusalem and its measurements. Look down at verse 16 of Revelation 21. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. Read that last sentence with me. And we read saying, its length and width and height are equal. What does that sound like? A cube. You remember the Holy of Holies? What was the... What was the Holy of Holies? It was built as a cube. Here we have the foreshadowing in the Old Testament. And here we have the fulfillment in eternity. And yet you see, as in the Old Testament, a holy God was, was separated and, and concealed and distanced away from his people. And yet in eternity, when we worship God, we will be immediately in his presence and in great relationship with him. Amen, church? You see, there will no longer be distance. There will no longer be separation. There will no longer be any concealment. There will not be any wonder on our parts. But we will be so filled with joy and understanding and knowledge. Immediately in relationship and in the presence of the one true God with no more interruption of sin. Again, church, can you say amen to that? Worship will also be, number two, all about redemption. Say that word with me, redemption. Worship will be all about redemption. And one day we're going to fully understand the fullness of Christ's redemptive work in our lives. You know, sometimes we can congratulate ourselves and sometimes we can think we're, we're doing pretty good. I suppose because none of us like, like to acknowledge our faults or our failures. Some of us are pretty bullheaded about that. But there's coming a day when not to shame us and not to make us feel bad. But there is coming a day when we will actually celebrate the fullness of Christ's redemptive work in our lives. I believe we will be able to recall every sin and fault and failure and shortcoming. Every mood, every emotion, every harsh word. But not to feel guilty. Not to be shamed. Not to be belittled. But instead, 
to point to Jesus and to worship him, understanding in full what he's done. Describing this, this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned and prepared for her husband, John notes the, the foundations, the foundations of, of the walls and, and the construction of, of the city itself. And there are 12 stones. How many stones, church? 12. There are 12 stones included in the foundations and the walls as, as we read in verses 18 through 20. Now, why are these stones so beautiful? Because again, if you go back to the Old Testament, and as you, as you consider the priest, as you consider the high priest, and, 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 and what that high priest would wear, and how that high priest would, would adorn himself in, in his ministry in the temple, the high priest would actually wear these same stones. These stones would be represented on the adornment of the high priest. And the high priest would wear these stones when once a year. How often? Once a year. He would go into, past the curtain, into the Holy of Holies. And on this day of atonement, on this Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., the high priest with these stones upon him would go into the Holy of Holies and taking the blood of, of yet another Passover lamb would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat over the Ark of, of the Covenant, making a sacrifice to God trying to provide for an atonement for the sins of the people. And this happened year after year after year until one year. Until one year on a Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., Jesus, hanging upon a cross, gave up his spirit, stating the words, it is finished. Finally, the Lamb of God shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins of all of those who would believe. And church, do you remember the rest of, of the story as it's told? What happens to the curtain in the temple? From top to bottom, the curtain was torn you see, this is the perfect redemptive work of Jesus. The Holy of Holies was again opened up. And we were no longer separated from God. Jesus and only Jesus shed his blood for the forgiveness of all of our sins. We were redeemed. And one day, without hesitation, without shame, without guilt, we will actually celebrate the redeeming work of Jesus. As we behold even in the construction and the glory and the light of heaven, all of it will remind us of the redeeming work of Jesus. And how only because of what he did in fulfillment of the Father's will, only because of Jesus, will we be there. Amen, church? Even today, what sins can you thank Jesus for forgiving? What have the struggles been? What has the temptation been? Where have you had to say sorry to Jesus and sorry to someone else? And yet in thanksgiving, already a, a foretaste, you can praise him.
for his redemption. Worship in full relationship. Worship because Jesus has redeemed us from all of our sins. One more, number three. Worship will be all about the rule and reign of Christ. Worship will be all about the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. We live in West Michigan, and in West Michigan, there are really three safe conversations to have. When you want to keep things uh, light and fluffy and you don't want to go too deep with too many people, you can talk about the weather, you can talk about work, and you can talk about worship. A lot of times we, we like to talk about the weather. Oh, looks a little sunny. Oh, now it's cloudy and there's a rainbow. Oh, now it's raining and look, the sun is back out again. It's already been a busy morning in terms of the weather. You can talk about work. Where do you work? What do you do for a living? You can do a little bit of networking and maybe set up an appointment or, or a time for coffee with somebody else to expand your circle. But every once in a while, you might even get to that place of asking somebody, where do you go to worship? Where do you go to church? Because you know what? Right now, worship is, is tied to a church. Worship is tied to a location. Worship is tied to a campus. Worship is tied to a time. Worship in heaven will have nothing to do with any of that. Worship in heaven will not have a set address or time. It will not be something we do to get it out of the way and to get it done. Worship is actually going to be our attitude. It's going to be our disposition. It's going to be our drive. It's going to be our joy. It's going to be our celebration. Worship is going to be in everything we do all the time with everyone as we celebrate the rule and reign of Jesus. Say that with me. As we celebrate the rule and reign of Jesus. Revelation 21, verse 22, it says this, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. You see, it's no longer about a building. It's no longer about a place. It's no longer about a ritual or a tradition or an order of worship and a structure that becomes so familiar and at times overly routine. All of that's going to pass away. Worship in heaven is going to be all about the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The kingdom has been handed over to him, and we are co-heirs of his righteousness for all of eternity. Amen, church? We will celebrate the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ who will finally bind up and cast into the bowels of hell Satan and all of his minions. There will no longer be such demons. There will no longer be temptation. There will no longer be malice. There will no longer be interruption. There will no longer be darkness. There will no longer be storm. There will no longer be the unexpected. Behold the rule and the reign of the Lamb of God, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Amen, people. Amen. And yet right now we wait. And yet, church, the best part is yet to come. You've probably heard the story before that I tried to share with the kids and we'll end. You know the story of the line of visitation at the funeral home. You've been there before because of those who you love. And people were walking up to the casket, the body lying in repose. And yet as they walked up this time, it wasn't the, the spray of flowers that caught their attention. It wasn't the outfit that the individual was wearing. Interestingly enough, it was their, their hands which were folded. And yet, in, in those clasped hands, 
there was a fork. And the story was told that this one who had departed to glory with her children and with her grandchildren and even her great-grandchildren, after any meal, when the plates were being cleared, she would always tell people, keep your fork because the best part is yet to come. Better than any dessert in this world is the world and the life that is to come. The best part is on the way. Amen? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be so. Thank you for the joy and the worship that will be heaven in all of our relationships and in all of our responsibilities that you are going to share with us. We'll look forward to that over the next two weeks. But right now, we thank you for the opportunity to worship, to warm up, to practice, and to get ready for all that awaits those who you so love. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.